scripted the interrogation as if it wasn't an interrogation at all. We scripted it as if it was just uh, an agent sitting in the room with him having to babysit him until they let him go. And this agent continued to sort of smile at him and, and show like really excitement about being in the room with them and, the, and he finally bit on it and started engaging the agent in conversation and one of the things the agent eventually said to him was like man I never thought that you that I'd ever be able to meet somebody like you and he said well, what do you mean and he said well come on I've read about all these really famous people Bundy, Dahmer, you know Gacy but as soon as we knew about them they were locked up and you know they're all gone but you're walking out of here you've committed six perfect crimes. And he says, well, you're giving me credit for one more than I've done so far. Because he wanted to brag about it. He was proud of the fact that he had committed that many perfect murders and was about to commit one more. Hi, I'm Allison Hope Weiner and welcome to Media Mayhem. I have one of my favorite guests back today, um, Jim Clemente is back, um, and we're going to be talking today about serial killers. And he has, I, I, he's been on the show before, but we haven't had the opportunity to really talk about what he did when he was at the FBI, which is uh, profiling. And he was in, what is it, the BAU unit? Um, now. I'm now I'm going into my um, criminal minds, because Jim also writes for criminal minds, and they're always talking about their unsub in the BAU unit. I have all the language down. Great. But we're actually going to be talking about real stories today in cases that uh, either uh, Jim has studied or that he's actually worked on. And what really brought me to wanting to have you come back was that on New Year's Eve, you held our, all of our friends were enraptured with like listening to your stories. And he was a very, very successful guest at our New Year's Eve soiree. It was a great party. Thanks, thanks. So first of all, let me switch gears from parting on New Year's Eve to serial killers. Mm -hmm. As only I can. Mm -hmm. First of all, let's talk about the Long Island serial killer. Um, there was a really good article that appeared in the New York Times uh, a while back, um, and they've been looking for the Long Island serial killer who advertises on Craigslist for his victims, tends to kill prostitutes, and in fact, it took them a long time to even recognize that there was a serial killer mm -hmm. um, because they were prostitutes and people that wouldn't be missed. And you provided for the New York Times a bit of a profile yes. um, and a portrait that emerged of the man. Uh, you, first of all, you talked about how the victims were being found, that they were being found in burlap sacks. You also talked about uh, the fact that he had called the sister of one of the victims right. on the victim's cell phone and mm -hmm. taunted her. And different evidence that brought you to conclusions about what that serial killer might look like. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, Allison, that when we look at serial killers, when we try to profile them, we have multiple crime scenes. And that actually gives us a tremendous amount of information because he picks a particular victim at a particular time, in a particular place, in a particular manner for a particular purpose. All those choices that he makes actually reveal things about him. So in this case, his choice of selection is, is first of all, he's looking for people who are willing to prostitute themselves. That means they're high-risk vi victims. They will put themselves in harm's way. That, that means it's easier for he to, him to get them. And that, that means his sophistication level can be much lower rather than trying to get somebody who is in a, their own home, somebody who's protected. So we now categorize him in the, he's not that criminally sophisticated level. And then you look at what, what is he doing with them? And that's sort of the other end of that crime scene, which is where we find the victims. He's putting them in a public place. He's hiding them fairly well. They were hidden for a while, but weather can unearth them in that situation. That's probably what happened. But he's hiding them in burlap sacks. Now, burlap sacks 20, 30, 40 years ago were probably much more common, but today plastic bags are much more common. And the thing about burlap, excuse me, the thing about burlap sacks is that they could be found and maybe traced more easily than the average plastic bag. So that's a problem for him. And that, that means that he wasn't as forensically sophisticated as well. So both of those sophistication levels are pretty low. But what is he doing? Well, he's attacking, he's drawing in and attacking women who are very vulnerable. They're um, certainly at a high risk themselves. And they, um, they have a lot of issues. And unfortunately, those women who fit into that category aren't missed as rapidly as other women would be. And so he's also building a sort of layer of protection that, well, these women probably wouldn't be missed as quickly, so he'd be able to get away with the crime easier. So he's taking sort of the easy way out in most of his choices. 
Um, but the thing that really tells us the most and reveals the most about his personality is that he used one of the cell phones of one of the victims to call her sister and basically taunt her. And that is a sadistic move. And that means that in his real life, this is the kind of guy who basically will, will laugh when somebody gets hurt. He'll really enjoy it if he gets to hurt somebody and, and watch their suffering. That's what sort of turns him on. And so that's the kind of person you should be looking for in the real world. Somebody lives with this guy or lives next to the guy or knows him from work. Um, clearly, he's, he's got a seasonal nature to his offending. And that might be because he's offending somewhere else during the rest of the year. And maybe this is the only time he's in this part of the, the country. He's and a tourist in that area or he could be. for the summer. Or it could be their summer home. You know, uh, It could be that his family is actually away during the summer, and that gives him the freedom to do this. So there's a lot of things that his behavior actually tells us that he didn't intend us to, to know. We call it leakage. And let me ask you, is it, is it uh, the fact that he would call somebody afterwards, isn't that kind of tempting the fates? Because I, I, it seems to me to be an unusual um, thing, because you don't usually read about some, right. a, a serial killer like sort of uh, identifying themselves in any way after the crime's been right. committed. It's the biggest risk that he took. Now, of course, he, he went into the middle of Manhattan, I think in Times Square, and made the call from there because there were probably a couple hundred thousand people within a square mile. And, you know, that means that he would blend in a little easier. So he took a risk, but he tried to mitigate that risk. So it does say that he has a little intelligence there. He's probably been watching some crime shows on TV or something. But the fact is that, that sadistic people like to cause pain and suffering. And perhaps he felt that because, uh, maybe because things hit the news and so on and so forth, that he wasn't able to do anything right then, and this was a way for him to relive the suffering that he caused to that particular victim and to escalate it by actually causing her sister some pain and suffering. Is it true, I mean, isn't that unusual that when the serial killer usually kills, aren't the, isn't there violence directed towards the person they killed? And that I always had read or heard that they don't really think of that person as a person and other people will be hurt by their disappearance or, or other people will miss them. I, well, was, I thought that was kind of unusual too. Yeah, well, it is, uh, it's slightly unusual but you have to understand there are a bunch of serial killers who like to taunt the police. Um, they like to basically say, show how great they are and that the police are not worthy. And so they'll sometimes communicate with the police. We've also had other cases, and, and of course they're not as public, uh, but we've had other cases in which the serial killer, the offenders, have contacted family members. And it really is an extension of the suffering that they cause to the victim. They want to have that secondary and tertiary, tertiary effect on the victim's family, and that, that is something they get off on. When you were looking at that, I mean, as far as you know, in terms of the investigation, it, it, when it involves prostitutes or, or victims that aren't immediately missed, does, does that mean that the chances of actually finding the perpetrator or the unsub are, are diminished? I mean, they're rapidly diminishing returns because sure. of the time lag? Sure. In any homicide investigation, the first 72 hours are really critical. And um, the, the solution rate after that is extremely low. Uh, however, in serial cases, because the offender keeps going, he raises the stakes and makes it, A, an FBI crime. So we get to in jump into the investigation every time we have primary jurisdiction on any serial murder case. But also, we will not let it go. I mean, it's not something, uh, sure, all police departments know, and there's no statute of limitations on murder, so there are always open cases. But Many times those local departments are overwhelmed with cases they're working now, and a cold case they, they, they rarely get around to solving just because of manpower and money issues. So, but the fact that he's doing these multiple kills uh, means that a lot more people and a lot more resources have been thrown at this. And I think the forensic evidence that was collected is going to eventually lead to his downfall. And also in the profile, you were quoted as saying that the killer was likely white and well-spoken, and I'm wondering, how do you find, I don't know if you recall, because it's been a, a while ago, but how do one, how, what sort of tells would suggest that somebody's white, if nobody's seen him? I was just curious yeah. about that, or well-spoken. Like, where did yeah. that kind of, where does that kind of information come from? Well, the fact that um, we get that from the, basically the, the, we get that basically from the race of the victims. Oh, okay. Sometimes, uh, Certain races will cross racial lines, and it's also the demographics of an area and so forth. But um, the fact that he's well-spoken 
comes out in the fact that he's interacting with these people. It's, you know, there's an ad and then there's some interaction and he's able to, he's not freakish enough to scare people away. And so he's probably able to talk them into a situation where he takes advantage of them, as opposed to somebody who just meets somebody who's passing by, hits them over the head and drags them away. This one has some ability to interact with human beings. And again, that puts him in a slightly higher echelon in terms of that communication skills. It seems to me like Craigslist is the, <laughs> is the be all and end all for serial killers. Oh. Is, is that something, if you did away with Craigslist, I mean, is that sort of a new feature in the world, uh, in the Absolutely. criminal? I mean, it Absolutely. Is I, I don't think you, you'll, I mean, doing away with Craigslist, something else will just take its place. I mean, there's chat rooms and there's all sorts of different forums online. You'd have to do away with the internet in total in order to actually make it safer. But the fact is that it has given offenders an entree to people that they never, ever would ever be able to get access to before. That's, that goes for prostitutes online and also children in their own bedrooms, in your own homes. So it's, a, it's become a tremendous tool for criminals. Conversely, it's also a tool for law enforcement because it's also a way for law enforcement officers to go undercover and actually pretend that they're a child or a prostitute. So, you know, they should look out because they may be talking to somebody who's actually, you know, a police officer and not somebody who's actually interested in sex with kids, for example. What do you think about the shows like, um, the, like the NBC show where um, the media pretended to be, they used their own people to mm -hmm. pretend to be child, children and that it wasn't really run by the police. The police came in after the fact to, uh, the, I, I'm just curious, what are your thoughts about making a case with that? Because it seems to me, my understanding is that most of those cases get thrown out because they weren't done yeah. in I, the That's exactly what I was going to say. In, in my mind, it would ru you'd run the risk of those cases not being prosecutable. And obviously, law enforcement officers and undercover investigation or, or investigators are highly trained in how to create a situation so they're not entrapping anyone right, yeah. and they're actually getting good, po positive information uh, during the course of the investigation and also given, giving the, the potential offender an out. And that way, it, they, they can over, no longer claim entrapment. And we do that. We, we very carefully structure our undercover operations so that we pr preserve the legal process. When un, you know, professionals in other fields try to do the same thing, uh, they typically fail. Uh, we, we would not say that a FBI or a detective should you know, do a reporting investigation. Uh, we do criminal investigations. Um, I mean, Basically. even the questioning portion of those shows, like, uh, you know, where to catch a predator, where the, the, the supposed uh, perpetrator is sitting at a table, and they, the way the questions are asked leave a lot of room, for wiggle room, like, why do you have condoms? And I always have condoms. You know, I mean, yeah, you exactly. came over here with condoms in your pocket. Right. It just seems really amateur hour. Well, it's unfortunate. I think the, they, they had some kind of volunteer group that was actually getting online doing that, and I would question the motives of that group, and who is in this group, and why are they getting involved in this stuff? Why aren't they uh, letting law enforcement do their job instead of sort of interfering with it? It's the drama of it. I'm sure it makes great TV, but if it doesn't make a good case, it's incredibly bad. It hurts more child victims than it helps. Let's go on to another case that you actually did work on, the Robert Spangler case. Mm -hmm. And I guess, first of all, could you set it up for our audience? Sure. Because I thought, I was reading about it, and it, it, it's almost a difficult to believe that somebody kept getting away with this. Well, Robert Spangler was one of the most interesting serial killers yeah. that I've ever worked on, and, and he was one of the most brilliant as well. He was up there with Bundy in terms of his IQ. Here's a guy who, back in the 70s, uh, got a little bored with his situation, so he decided to kill his wife on Christmas Eve and his uh, son and daughter, his teenage son and daughter. I uh, set it all up um, and killed them and had had his wife sign a bunch of Christmas cards. One of them he typed out to be a uh, suicide note. So they, they cleared him and they said it was a murder-suicide by the wife. Uh, years later, his second wife actually got away for a while and uh, she divorced him. But his third wife, he took her to the Grand Canyon and he had her posing for a picture, and then he pushed her off. And then his second wife came back to console him because now he had lost two wives. And then that night she died of a poisoning, an overdose of pills, again ruled a suicide. So you have a murder-suicide, an accidental death, and a, uh, and a suicide. Uh, just that's a coincidence? Like I think not, right, exactly. <laughs> so, no, that's okay. And then his fourth, actually his fourth wife, he was bringing her to the Grand Canyon 
for sort of a honeymoon. Uh, was she aware could, that that's where he well, had taken? Well, this is why the case is so amazing. She was actually going to go with him. We got him to a position uh, through really using our brains to uh, feed his ego so that he just forgot that he was sitting in a room with an FBI agent. And he actually started bragging about what he had done. And we convinced him that we weren't going to arrest him, but that the profilers were going to interview him and make him famous. And he so loved that idea that he bought his wife or fiance at the time with him to the interview when we did this behavioral interview with him. And she was sitting there holding his hand the whole time, and he carefully you know, talked about every detail of what he had done back in the 70s. And basically what he said was, it was, very, it was Christmas Eve, so it was so easy to get my wife to go down to the basement with a blindfold on. And so what I did was I put the gun here, I figured it would be about where she would shoot if she was holding it herself, and I shot her in the head, and then I put the, the gun on the floor where I thought it would fall. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. I went upstairs and I took care of the kids first. And by took care of the kids first, he meant, walked into my daughter's bedroom, shot her in the chest, killing her, then walked into my son's bedroom. He had awakened by the shot from my daughter, so he was kind of up and I shot him. He was moving around. He didn't die from that. And I figured, hmm, I should probably finish him off in a way that my wife would. So I took the pillow and I suffocated him. And he was struggling, of course, but he couldn't, you know, he couldn't do anything compared to me. And, and then... And then he went back downstairs, put the gun down, typed out the, the suicide note on one of the Christmas cards that she had already signed, and then went out to the movies. And when I came back, I, of course, discovered them and was very distraught. So he, he lays all this out, and then we said to him, that's great, but, you know... So the wife, the current wife is holding his hand... Holding his hand through this whole thing, and then, then he, he goes on to say, well, we told him, I'm sorry, but he only wanted to tell us about that event, because it's so long ago and there were no survivors and all that other stuff. And then we, we told him, well, you know, the problem is that that's one incident. It's, you're not a serial killer then. We really can't do anything for you. I'm sorry. And he's like, no, no, you'll get your serial. And he then explains the other two kills that he did. And so she's still sitting next to him. And we take her aside after this and we say, so you need to stay away from him. We're, we're not going to arrest him right now. And she said, no, no, no. He loves me. I'm different and he isn't like that anymore. So we didn't let her go home with him because obviously <laughs> there was a risk there and you know, the next day we arrested him and he ended up dying in prison. But he was, he was a fascinating guy because he did a few things. He had a radio show at night where he would write poetry and little stories about how a friend of his met an untimely demise, things like that. He was again bragging. This is the kind of sadistic thing. Uh, you know, he wants to get off on this. He also made a safety video for the National Park Service about how dangerous the trails were in the, in the Grand Canyon area. I mean, it's just Especially unbelievable. He's taking you. But even but during that video, one of the things that told us that feeding his ego was really going to help us break him is that during the video when he says, and then I re reached out to try to save her, and I almost fell off too because I had heavy, heavy pack on and I was really at risk here, but luckily I didn't go. Well, it always has to be about himself, and that just revealed so much about his narcissism that we said if we feed that narcissism he's gonna forget where he is and just start bragging about what he did and it worked. When did he come onto your radar? Well, Which wife? Well I think um, it was it, it was just the the fact that he had been in several different towns and states so none of them put it together. I think the FBI agents and the National Park Service um, got together talking about it and it wasn't until after the third one but for so many years they just couldn't they couldn't get any more evidence on them. They were following, they were doing all these other things. Okay. They couldn't get any actual forensic evidence. So we were able to get some behavioral evidence. Did you get him right before he went on that last trip? Yes, it was two weeks before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how long had he, was he married to the last one? Well, you know, how he had been with her for a couple of years. Somebody? Yeah, it's weird because it, it varied. And, and he actually admitted later that, well, he thought killing was easier than divorce. So he made sure he went back and got the woman who divorced him so he could clean up that mess. I mean, <laughs> literally, like any psychopath, he treated people as if they were furniture. He, they were things to use. They were, there was no emotion at all connected. Can you imagine having a wife and, and being with her for 15 years, having two children that you created and lived with you and loved you and looked up to you, and just coldly just going and shooting them or shooting them and smothering them. I just, I that's, and calling it taking care of the kids. That's what's amazing about this guy. It's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, language. It's, so did you do, did, did they do a brain scan on him? You know, I don't think they did. Uh, but 
Yeah, he would have been an interesting one because he was so smart and, and because he really know, was. He was so sadistic and so really. And, and, and in terms of having made any mistakes, I mean, it sounds like in retrospect. I'm just as you're telling it to me. I mean, like typing the note when somebody types. Um, the suicide note, don't you wonder if somebody else did it? Is that like of a course. flag? Always? Of course, yeah. yeah, sure. So it was a, all of these were suspicious to them every single right. time somebody died. Right, but the thing that he did though was he used the fact that she typically typed out her Christmas cards. So he used something that, we, that was known to have been done by her before. He was very smart, but in the end his ego killed him. So when, what makes somebody, I mean, is it, does he keep marrying to get additional victims? Is that your thought? Or why did he keep getting married if he tired so quickly? I mean, was this his, just his victim um, farming, uh, you know, getting yeah, the people in? Something like that. I mean, you know, he's, he's a human being, you know, and he likes when people look up to him. So he likes it when he gets into a situation where somebody, where he can actually convince somebody to fall in love. He's very charismatic. And many of these guys are, the, the very intelligent ones, um, like Bundy. Uh, you know, and, and it's sort of a challenge for them. And even after, and he used the fact that his three previous wives had died to draw this fourth one in. The suffering, please feel sorry for me. Oh, I've been through so much. You know, that's one of the ways he uses to get them to love him. Is there a certain cachet for serial killers? I mean, where if they're just a single killer, I mean, that I mean, is that a, a, have you found in interviewing other and studying other serial killers that the idea is to get a certain fame by the number of people yes. that you're killing? In fact, what we did was we scripted the interrogation as if it wasn't an interrogation at all. We scripted it as if it was just uh, an agent sitting in the room with him, having to babysit him until they let him go. And this agent continued to sort of smile at him and, and show like really excitement about being in the room with them. And, the, and he finally bit on it and started engaging the agent in conversation. And one of the things the agent eventually said to him was like, man, I never thought that you, that I'd ever be able to meet somebody like you. And he said, what do you mean? And he said, well, come on, I've read about all these really famous people, Bundy, Dahmer, you know, Gacy. But as soon as we knew about them, they were locked up and, you know, they're all gone. But you're walking out of here, you've committed six perfect crimes. And he says, well, you're giving me credit for one more than I've done so far. Because he wanted to brag about it. He was proud of the fact that he had committed that many perfect murders and was about to commit one more. So we just used that, his own personality against him. Now, Very when effective. you're dealing with Dom, I mean, when you look at the case of Jeffrey Dahmer, who uh, was, I guess, taking... Very different animal. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I'm curious. He was taking a young boys and, um, and, and murdering those boys and keeping pieces of them. And yeah, it's, he, he actually only had one boy that we know of, but uh, most of his victims were, were young men. Young men. Um, but... Yeah, he is a totally different animal. Here's a guy who his entire childhood was very insular, very to himself, would pick up roadkill on the, on the side of a road and, and bring it home and study it and probably do other nasty things that you don't want to hear about um, with it. And he, he, he basically had a curiosity about what the inside of people look like. And, and he, again, was a psychopath and did not at all think of the, the human being or the animal that actually was embodied there, but just something to s satisfy his own curiosity. He also wanted to make a sex slave. And so he basically experimented with injecting, drilling, boring holes into skull, the skulls, of the live victims, and putting in battery acid and other things to try to make them zombies, basically, so he could just use them for sex. Um, very nasty guy, extremely nasty guy, and, and horrendous what he did to all these. But was he people. as intelligent as the other guys? That no, he wasn't in that same level of intelligence. I think he was that just that again picking victims that wouldn't be missed. Uh, pretty much, uh, and it, you know, and it was victims who were high risk. Unfortunately, I mean, he would pick them up at you know gay bars or street hustlers and that kind of stuff. But one of the victims that he picked up, this is the greatest tragedy of the case, is that. You know, he was a 15-year-old Asian boy who couldn't really speak that English that well, and he actually escaped, and he was naked, and he was bleeding. And when, when the cops picked him up, uh, Dahmer shows up and says, oh, he's just my boyfriend, and uh, he's drunk. And they just gave him back to him, and then he killed him and chopped him up and ate parts of him. Yeah, it's pretty nasty. So he was, he was a very, very, he was, he's on the far extreme of the types of 
serial killers that we've seen. There's been a few of them like that, and, and one or two that have done worse things. But um, he's definitely an extreme. Well, let me um, switch gears so I won't have too many nightmares tonight. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> like, ah! um, and let me ask you, I, I actually wondered if, as we've been seeing all, in all this gun control and, and Newtown has been in the news, and I'm curious if somebody who comes out and does a mass shooting qualifies, is, is qualifies as a serial killer and if they have some of the same attributes or are there things you can look at in profiling a person to see if they're going to be engaging in, a, in sort of a mass spree killing? Sure. Well, first of all, we do distinguish in the behavioral analysis unit, in the behavioral analysis um, field, between serial killers who have multiple incidents of kills over time and mass killers who kill multiple people at one time. And there is a definite difference in psychology, personality, MO, ritual, and so forth. Typically we see the mass killers as wanting to blow up and get as much media and attention as they possibly can, where serial killers want to keep mostly a low profile so that they can keep killing forever. They don't want to ever get caught, basically, although the smart ones and some of the dumb ones will try to taunt the police and interact with us, and therefore they typically, that typically hurts them in the long run. But the difference in terms of what their, their personality and, the, and what they choose to do can manifest itself in many different ways in their life, can manifest itself in many different ways in the killing. Typically, the mass shooters will, will be at a distance. In other words, they're not, they're not having personal, close, in-your-face contact. It's at a distance with a gun. You can kill from a distance. It's easier to do that when you, when you realize they're human beings. Now, serial killers have to get up close and personal. They, you know, they actually interact with their, their victims, except when you have a sniper serial killer like Muhammad and, that's, and yeah. uh, So that's uh, sort Malvo. of the bridge, isn't it? That yeah, that the was sniper. the difference, yes. And yeah. if, but can you profile um, a, 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 a shooter like that? Like, In I mean, advance, you mean? Yeah. Well, here's the problem. Uh, there are certainly indications, and, and Dr. Fallon's work, Jim Fallon, uh, has done a lot of work in this area and it's really fascinating about the the gene, the serial killer gene basically. Uh, the problem is that it, it's not predictive because you have to have, it's sort of a, a combination of biopsycho and he, social. He was, on, he was yeah. on the show talking about that there have to have certain, certain action and a certain brain setup. Right. And what I like to say is that the genetics loads the gun, the personality and psychology aims the gun, and the experiences of that person pull the trigger. And I think if you don't have a combination of all three of those things, you're not going to have the serial killer. So what, it's the same with the mass shooter. And I think there has to be sort of that perfect storm of all three of those things. Otherwise, you're not going to be, uh, you're not going to act out. So it's very difficult to say in a predictive way, if somebody has these characteristics and they've, and they've uh, experienced these things, that they are actually going to go out and kill because there's that personality and, and, um, and psychology factor. And that is, the personality is the filter through which they experience life. So two people who have very different personalities can go through exactly the same things. They can even have the same genetics, but they experience it as totally different events because they, they are a hater or a lover, you know, basically what it breaks down to. You could have twins who go through life and they they're, have a terribly difficult life and they see their parents struggling and trying to put food on the table and, and keep a roof over their head. And one of the twins says, look at that. I mean, they're struggling so much. I, I can't believe they, they go without eating so that we can. I mean, they're just wonderful people. I wish that I could do something for them. When I grow up, I'm going to help them. And the other one can say, look at that. They're not even giving us what we deserve. I mean, we deserve better. They're failures. I hate them. I want to kill them. And that's the same, you know, genetic, same situation, but very different personality. And one other thing I'd like to add is that people participate in the formation of their personality. It's the tiny little, billions of tiny little decisions that they make throughout their life in the privacy of their own mind. You know, whether they're going to think, they're going to look at somebody and say, oh, that person is nasty, or I don't like that person, or I'm going to do something mean to them, or they're going to say, I feel bad for that person, I'm going to be nice to them. Mm -hmm. and, that, and as you do that over and over and over again throughout your life, you reinforce those things, and it becomes part and parcel of your personality. Let me talk to you. This is, I mean, I have just two more things because we're coming to the end of the show, but a couple, two more questions, really. I wonder when you look at serial killers and something, do you think that the interest in society in catching them is completely tied to how much we value their victims? 
and mm -hmm. such as uh, the case of the serial killer in Anaheim who was killing the homeless people, and a long way back to the serial killer in Orange County who was killing a runaway teen boys. And I'm just curious if if you think that that comes into how much resources we will allocate. Has it been your experience that de it depends on how much we value the victims, how much we will uh, we will notice? Or it's put resources towards first, I think, yeah. both I think, two part parts. Yeah, I think there's the, the first part is that I think there's a, uh, a fundamental issue first. If you pick victims that aren't that are sort of throwaways in society, runaways, um, prostitutes, other, other throwaways, hitchhikers, and so forth, it's difficult at first for society to realize that the serial killer is, is out there operating. Obviously, if you pick suburban housewives or 15-year-old girls in Orange County, it's going to make the news right away. So that's the first okay. uh, reason so why it might take longer. So there'll be attendant publicity. But I will, yeah. yeah, but I will tell you that the, the serial killer case in Orange County where he was killing homeless people, I, I, I did uh, interact with the FBI on that and I did talk a little bit in the public about it because uh, the FBI wanted to get out that these, that typically homeless people sleep on their own separated and, and they should congregate now to, to help each other. They should create little societies so that they will actually protect each other because this guy was going after lone people. And, and it actually did actually help because what happened was somebody noticed him attacking one of the guys and chased him down. So that actually led to his, his capture. And so I think there is certainly, <laughs> in the media, unfortunately, there's certainly much more hullabaloo about a serial killer who's killing decent members of the society and serial killers who kill the forgotten or the fringe members of society and that's unfortunate but I think law enforcement when you hear Doesn't about a serial a killer we go at it with we go at that person with you know everything that we have and I hope that uh, we get to resolve cases on both sides of that those railroad tracks well and here's my last question um, the, there was a report recently in a Colorado newspaper that reported exclusively based on interviews with grand jurors and other sources knowledgeable about the John Bonet Ramsey case that the grand jury investigating the Christmas night 1996 death of six year old John Bonet Ramsey voted to indict both of the girl's parents. So the grand jury voted to indict the eight women and four men of the grand jury had heard evidence from September 1998 to October 1999. And then the sources told the camera, um, as the newspaper, that then Boulder District Attorney Alex Hunter declined to sign the indictment, which is really unusual, and go forward with the prosecution based on his determination that the evidence was not sufficient to prove the charge beyond a reasonable doubt. Do, since you had some involvement in the case, do you agree with uh, former District Attorney Hunter's decision? Well, there's been a little more history with that District Attorney, and, um, and I disagree. Uh, I disagree vehemently uh, because as time went on, the chances of actually prosecuting that case got worse and worse. But the allegations are that that district attorney um, actually interfered with the investigation in the first place. And probably not for a nefarious reason, probably because he didn't understand that type of crime. Wasn't there some discussion that he was friends with the Ramseys? Yes, and there, that there, he, he was friends supposedly so, with John Ramsey and he said that I know John Ramsey and he's not capable, a parent is not capable of doing this. Well he's very wrong, he's absolutely wrong, he has never investigated this kind of case in his life and as I think I've said on this show before, there's never been a case like this before or after. There's no serial killer out there who is doing these kinds of things. This is a aberration in law enforcement history. However, I think the district attorney had made up his own mind based on his relationship with Mr. Ramsey, and I think he did it based on his ignorance of how to investigate these crimes and who actually commits these crimes. So you don't think he was making, I mean, to me, it sounds like he made a personal decision despite the fact it, that a grand jury had voted to indict. I mean, and normally, I mean, isn't it, it is, at least in my understanding, it's very unusual for a district attorney to go against an indictment. Well, that's the thing. The I district mean, attorney, that what you want? yeah, the district <laughs> attorney calls the grand jury. He presents the evidence to that same grand jury. For him to then go against it, he was probably hoping that that wouldn't happen. And he thought it wouldn't happen, but in fact, they did. If in fact they did, then well, that, that's a very extremely rare thing for a prosecutor to go against the grand jury based on the evidence that he presented to that grand jury. It just seems to me it's another exam, uh, example of how poorly this case was handled from the get-go and how much personal relationships played in protecting 
John Ramsey and Patsy Ramsey. And even John Ramsey's re response to this latest news was, oh, it's more drama. I mean, it, seriously? Well, yeah. I mean, that's a big deal to hear that there was an indictment that a, that a then sitting district attorney opted to ignore. Right. Well, it doesn't surprise me based on the statements that he allegedly made during the beginning of the investigation. I think one or two of the investigating officers resigned as a result of that. Uh, because there were so many, so much interference uh, from the district attorney's office, um, uh, you know, it's it's unfortunate because again, when I said the first 72 hours of a homicide are extremely important, unfortunately, those 72 hours were filled with delays, and uh, and now all these all these years later, it's still an unresolved matter. Um, and. I, I want to just ask you, I guess I, we have a tiny little bit more. I wondered um, when you were a profiler. I'm um, still a profiler. <laughs> when so you were in know, the FBI, sorry, yeah. I guess. Okay. So uh, I'll, sorry, I'll fix that. No, it's joking. cool. It's yeah. cool. When you were in the FBI and you were profiling, what, and they always do this on the show on Criminal Minds, but the BAU decides like to take on certain cases and decides not to take on mm -hmm. other cases, and everybody gets all upset. It's like part of the drama of the show, yeah. you know, like, oh, people are dying. We need to go save them. Um, so I'm wondering, what are the elements that, that make, would make the BAU, I mean, when you were working there, like made them decide that this was a case worth taking on? Like when, when do they decide to take cases and when don't they? And what elements like are, are part of that decision? Well, first I have to say that uh, that, that that tug of war that happens on TV is, that fake? is for drama purposes. Ah. Actually, any serial killer case in the country or around the world, we will work absolutely. But what if we have and, two serial killer well, cases? Well, that's at what the I was going to say. Yeah. I mean, fortunately, so there's a big outbreak of serial killer. So fortunately, we have a number of teams, and it's not just one team. So we're all working <laughs> side by side, and sometimes we're all. Is there a team on another network? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Not yet, but I'm working on it. Uh, but no, but the, so we do have multiple teams operating at the same time. Sometimes we split up our teams, to, and, and there have been times when we don't, we've only been able to send one person at a time because we're so overburdened. I mean, our, our budgets were shrunk multiple times over the years that I was there. But in fact, if, if any police agency calls us about any homicide or any child abduction or any uh, rape or series of rapes, or sexual victimization case, anything to do with violent crime or sex crimes, we will endeavor to help them out. It, if we have uh, a bunch of serial ca cases or child abduction that are happening now, uh, one of the other ones, if it's a cold case, we'll, we'll get a lot lower priority, but eventually we, we should get around to it. And I would encourage any police agency to call them because there, there are a whole bunch of really qualified profilers there who only all they want to do is help. They don't go in and take away the case. They assist law enforcement officers literally around the world in helping solve these crimes. Have you been watching any of the Jody Arias trial? I know you've been really busy. I have been way too busy. Tell me what's going no, on. No, I mean, Jody Arias, this is something that kind of fascinates me, and I wonder if you think this is somebody that might have killed more than once because she is a demure, attractive woman who was dating a man named Travis Alexander. And apparently, I mean, it, 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 she had a lot of sex with Travis Alexander. It was sort of like his girl on the side or his booty call, and he was dating other women. Um, and what ended up happening is she began to stalk him and notice who he was dating, and she was checking his phone messages. And there's a lot of evidence that she was like keeping tabs on him. She goes to his house, they have sex, he goes to take a shower, this is what they're, she's on trial for. She allegedly stabs him like 30 times in the back. She cuts his throat, as Nancy Graceful wow. says, in a smiley face. <laughs> I know. From well, ear to ear. That's Nancy. No, and Nancy Grace, because she, she sexed him up and then she sliced him up. I mean, it's like horrible. It's, well, and she sits at the table. That's a human being that we're talking about here, yeah. She sits at the table. And she is, like I said, just super quiet. And it is so hard to reconcile the image of, that, of this attractive young woman. And this was a pretty big guy, like mm -hmm. stabbing this guy. And now she's said that she's done it in self-defense. Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious, she has a whole bunch of different boyfriends, like in different places, according right. to the prosecution. I, I'm, and the defense case is just underway. So I, I, and I've been, I've been watching it. But I'm, I'm just curious, is when you see something that's that violent, does that trigger a, a question in, in professionals such as mm -hmm. yourself as to whether or not somebody killed before? Well, certainly violence is something that, uh, you know, is, is, a, is a wall that people have to break through, that normal human beings have to break through. And once they do, certainly it's easier to do it again and again. And, and stalking behavior is, is, you know, that obsessive behavior involved in stalking is, is also the kind of thing that we see in pattern offenders. So there's that. 
Um, clearly, if she, if she had other boyfriends that they know about, um, you know, that seems to be... Would you check to, be, to see if everybody's still... Well, yeah, I would check to see that. But, I mean, that, that seems to be her victim pool, all right, where she hunts, or she hunted this guy. So uh, I'm not sure. I think it probably would be obvious if she had done that. But I wouldn't... Uh, it wouldn't surprise me that, that she, if she in the past was wronged by somebody and she did something that maybe was seen as an accident or suicide or, um, you know, a disappearance. And I would look for those things in her history. Of course, I don't know anything there about her. There was some violence her. in her past. Well, okay, yeah. so. I'm just checking I to would see. Look for yeah, that. yeah, yeah. That's pretty good. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. All right, well, us. it's always great to be here, Alex. Jim is gonna come back um, uh, pretty soon, so watch for him, since he's one of our, our favorite guests here. And we're gonna be talking about some other really interesting topics and some news, so you should tune in and I also want everybody to keep subscribing. Our contest is ongoing and it'll be uh, for a winner, will uh, the a new subscriber will win an iPad mini and the best commenter uh, will also win an iPad mini. So keep at it. We like hearing from you. I read all the comments as much as I can. I don't read them all, but I try to look at all of them and respond. Um, I don't read the ones that are really unpleasant. Mm -hmm. But anyway, no, I do read quite a bit of them and I really appreciate you guys being engaged with the shows and giving us your thoughts. And I want to thank you again. Thank I know you. you have to get back because you have an episode of Criminal Minds yes. shooting. So thanks so much for joining yeah, us. Watch Criminal Minds too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, we sort, of we sort of told them. I mean, I, did you do an episode? I don't remember about the, uh, the, uh, the murder. In, uh, the Long in the Island? Gra the, no, not the Long Island one, the Rocky, the um, Grand Canyon one. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did that's it. what we, I thought. We did one about Spangler. We did one about the Long Island serial killers. Actually, I did it. I wrote it before that case was even discovered. But it was something that I thought would be, would be likely to happen. And in fact, it did happen. It happened. It broke, actually, while we were in the middle of shooting that episode. It was pretty amazing. Oh, that's good timing. Yeah. Well, some people thought I did it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, yeah. we will get only the best guests yeah. here at Media Mayhem. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. All right. Take care.